All right. Uh, happy Monday, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Graphs and Matrix seminar. Today, Daryl Funk will be talking about uh, the class of bicircular matroids since they have only a finite number of excluded minors. Uh, thanks, Rose. Um, yeah, so this is a result that um, was announced some time ago, actually. <laughs> so, so Luis gave a really nice talk, um, my co-author here, Luis Godin, gave a, gave a really nice talk in 2011 in Maastricht on this topic. And the paper got lost to the mists of time um, shortly thereafter that. And uh, we've resurrected it. I, I met with, so I met with Matt and Luis for this purpose uh, about a year, fall a year ago. Um, and we, we worked through following the roadmap that Matt and Luis had laid out um, prior. And uh, it took a little bit of additional bushwhacking to, to make our way through too, but we came up with a proof that, uh, like I say, followed their roadmap, but uh, perhaps with some detours. Um, in particular, the bound is not near as good as um, they, they originally uh, felt they had um, in terms of the number of elements in an excluded minor. Um, um, but but <laughs> we want to at least get it written down eventually because the world's been waiting and, uh, and now at least we have a proof that the number is finite, even if we don't know exactly um, that the list we have so far is, is all there are. Um, but that's the next project. So what's a bicircular matroid? I guess I should tell, tell everybody that first, to make sure we're all um, on the same page. So take a graph. Um, the bicycles of your graph are um, minimal with respect to having more edges than, than vertices. So we call these the bicycles of the, of the graph. And um, the bicircular matroid of the graph is the graph who is the matroid whose um, circuits are the collection of bicycles of your graph. So um, we have these uh, subdivisions of these three types of subgraphs. We call these handcuffs, uh, tight, loose handcuffs, and this is a theta subgraph, right? So a pair of vertices um, linked by a pair of three internally disjoint paths, we call that a theta subgraph. That's the third type of um, circuit that appears in a, as a bicycle in a graph. We wanna have the class closed under minors. Um, so, we're just going to include direct sums with loops so that we can include loops and have a minor closed class that way. Uh, these are transversal matroids. They're the transversal matroids of set systems where every element appears in the most two sets. And so they have this really nice um, affine representations as um, uh, points on the one skeleton of a, of a real simplex where your points are always in general position. So no coincidental dependencies. Um, and you get from any, uh, affine representation like this, um, the graph. Uh, just place a vertex of your graph for every vertex of your simplex and points that are on the edges of your, um, on, the, on the one skeleton of your simplex, just those are the edges, right? This vertex is on the vertex, this element is on the vertex, so it's a loop, right? Um, another way to think of your bicircular matroid is um, kind of as an analog, well, you get a, a vector matroid representing a graph from the signed incidence um, matrix of your graph, right? For each of these negative, well, you put a zero for a loop, of course, a loop has a, a column of zeros in the cycle matroid. Replace all those minus ones with um, elements uh, is long, that um, make your uh, sets of columns maximally free. So every cycle then is, is independent. And if you've got enough elements in your field, you can always do this. So, by circular matroid is, is representable over any sufficiently large field. Um, and, and so you can, a nice way to think of a by circular matroid is, is this analogous um, struct construction with, um, with cycle matroids. So we know of 27 excluded minors for the class. And this is due to a computer search by Dylan Mayhew and Gordon Royal. Um, the largest um, excluded minor that we know of has ranked five of nine elements. And this computer search uh, by uh, Dylan Gordon uh, has shown there's no others with uh, fewer than 11 elements. Uh, we conjecture this list is complete. Um, I wouldn't be absolutely shocked if we found another excluded minor with, with a few more elements perhaps, but um, I think this list is probably all there are. Um, but we're just gonna prove today that, uh, that the list is finite. The list of excluded minors for this class is, is finite. So our strategy is uh, to show that no excluded minor has, has rank bigger than seven, first off. And we do that 
by um, supposing that you know, we've taken a fluted minor, if rank bigger than seven, we show that it's quasi-graphic. I'll tell you what that is in a moment. And we use that structure to, um, to show that actually this purported excluded minor, it's already got, excuse me, it's got a smaller excluded minor inside of it. So it's a contradiction. And then for, um, for ranks smaller than seven, well, we, we have a really rough uh, upper bound in the number of elements that, that may be permitted to exist in an excluded minor. And so that immediately gives you the, the result that the number of excluded minors is finite. All right, so what's a quasi-graphic quasi matroid? I have to talk quite a bit about these um, objects, um, but it pays dividends in the proof later on. So these are introduced by Jim Gielen, Bert Gerards, and Jeff Whittle, in the 2017 paper. So uh, let M be a matroid, let G be a graph, same, same ground, edge set of your graph is the ground set of your matroid. We say the graph G is a framework for the matroid M. If the edge set of every component has rank in the matroid at most the number of vertices in the component, if every time you delete a vertex along with its incident edges and then take the closure uh, of the resulting edge set in the matroid, you don't pick up any more elements aside from possibly loops at that vertex. And, and thirdly, no circuit of the matroid induces more than two components in your graph. So that's called a framework for your matroid and a matroid is quasi-graphic if it has a framework. Okay, so um, cycle matroids and bicircular matroids are both quasi-graphic matroids and they share the same framework actually. If you take a graph and you just think of all the, all the matroids that would share that graph as a framework, um, the cycle matroid of that graph is the, the tightest in terms of independent set. It's, the, it's got the most dependencies of all possible quasi-graphic matroids with that framework. Well, the bicircular matroid is on the other extreme. It's the freest possible matroid you could have uh, with framework G. And in general, there can be many uh, matroids whose independent sets um, can sit between these two extremes. To describe uh, these independent sets uh, properly for, you know, because there can be many, many uh, matroids with the same framework, uh, we're gonna use um, the notion of a bias graph. So uh, a bias graph is the graph together with a collection of um, cycles of the graph that obey the, the theta property I'm calling it. So the theta property is the property uh, of the collection curly B, which says if, if two of the cycles in, my, in any theta subgraph uh, of my graph uh, appear in my collection B, then the third cycle also is in there. Right? Cycles in my collection curly B are called balanced. Cycles not in that collection are unbalanced. This graph. And frameworks define bias graphs. So if you've got a framework for a quasi-graphic matroid, and you set your collection curly B to be the set of all cycles of the graph that are circuits of the matroid, you get a bias graph. Uh, now, if you've got a circuit in your matroid and you wanna know what does it look like in my framework, well, either it's a, a balanced cycle or it's one of these uh, subdivision of one of these types of subgraphs. So I'm, I'm calling a pair of, um, a pair of uh, unbalanced cycles that meet in exactly one vertex, uh, tight handcuffs, I call a pair of vertex disjoint unbalanced cycles with a minimal path between them, loose handcuffs. I'm gonna call a pair of vertex disjoint unbalanced cycles that um, like that, a bracelet, and then there's thetas, All right? So if you're a circuit of the matroid, of a quasi-graphic matroid, it appears as one of these subgraphs in your um, framework. The, the collection B of balanced cycles sorts out, you know, which, which cycles are circuits and which cycles are independent we need to sort out somehow which bracelets are circuits and which are independent, right? Because you know, some, some of them are possibly uh, circuits and some of them like this pair of unbound cycles uh, is, is independent, right? Uh, here's how we do it. So this, this is a, a notion that appeared in a paper with myself, Nathan Bowler and Daniel Salati a bit recently. A bracelet function is a function that assigns to each bracelet of your bias graph, uh, one of dependent or independent. Okay, well, you can't just do it willy nilly. So um, how do you do it to make sure you get a, a matroid out of it? I'm gonna divide an auxiliary graph called the bracelet graph of my bias graph where the vertex set is a collection of bracelets. And then you join two bracelets with an edge if and only if when you take the union of the bracelets you get one of these three uh, subgraphs. So this is meant to, it's gonna capture a, a circuit elimination axiom, right? So, so for example, you know, here's a bracelet, 
here's a bracelet, their union forms this subgraph. This is a circuit. So if this is a circuit, um, circuit elimination is gonna imply this has gotta be a circuit too, right? So that's the, that's the motivation here. That's the reason for this definition. We'll say a, a great a bracelet function is proper if it's constant on every component of this auxiliary graph that we've defined. And so given a, a bias graph and then some bracelet function, define curly C of the GB chi to be the collection of edge sets of these, these, these graphs where you take as circuits those bracelets that are assigned dependent by this function and you take as independent those bracelets that are assigned independent by that function. And then we have this, this uh, what I think is a quite nice result that that collection is a set of circuits of a matroid if and only if that function um, is proper. So it's constant on those components of the auxiliary graph we constructed. And even better, um, this describes all quasi-graphic matroids. So the condition or the, you got a quasi-graphic matroid with framework G and, the, and with curly B, the set of cycles of the graph that are surface of the matroid, if and only if uh, there exists some, this should say there exists uh, a proper bracelet function chi such that um, you get a, this is your set of circuits. Right? So this is how we're gonna um, tease out or understand not only which cycles are independent and which are dependent, but which bracelets are dependent and which bracelets are independent. So graphic matroids now you can easily see, um, they're just quasi-graphic matroids that have every single circuit, um, uh, sorry, every single cycle, uh, a circuit of the matroid, right? And by circular matroids, well, they're the quasi-graphic matroids that have no cycles that are circuits and no pairs of, uh, no bracelets um, that are circuits. Right? So, I mean, it's tight as possible, right? And uh, as, as free as possible uh, in the bicircular case. So here's some excluded minors. We can practice um, understanding these notions of uh, bias graphs and, and bracelet functions maybe a little bit by um, looking at some bias graphs. So 2C3 is the graph or three cycle with, with doubled set of edges, right? So it's really just a pair of a, a triple of uh, parallel classes of size two, right? So um, I can represent it in a, in a, in a, in a, bi in a bicircular matroid, the only way to represent a pair of parallel elements is a pair of uh, tight handcuffs like so, right? This is a circuit of size two. Um, so I can't represent this as a bicircular matroid, but I can, I can represent it as a um, bias graph, um, as a quasi-graphic matroid, right? I got this cycle three, four, it's a balance cycle, right? So I've, I've drawn it red to indicate balance, right? Similarly for uh, the cycle matroid of K4, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I have a button I can push that doesn't zoom in on you when I want to draw pictures. So K4 is your, there it is normally, but um, I can draw another framework. It's a little more convenient for finding it as a, uh, as a, as a minor in, in our setting. And so here's a framework for K4 where um, each of these three cycles is circuits, sorry, is a, is a pair of loose handcuffs. And this, this three circuit here, two, four, six is a balance cycle, for example. And then here's one more here. The, I don't know why this is called PF, but uh, here's an excluded minor for uh, the class of uh, bicircular matroids. And here's two of its frameworks. Uh, it's quasi-graphic, right? So the plane one, two, three, four um, shows up in, in this framework as a, pair, as a dependent bracelet. Uh, and then in this framework, uh, it's, a, it's a balance cycle. Is this all? Uh, is this all good so far? I, mean, I feel like I'm flying along at a at a blistering pace, but maybe maybe not. Any questions? So, so uh, the red cycles are the balance cycles. So I'm using case? red to to just kind of highlight balance cycles and um, dependent bracelets. So this this red set of edges is a balance cycle. It's it's this this circuit here. One two three four. And in this framework, uh, one, 
one, two, three, four is a, a pair of vertex disjoint unbalanced cycles forming a circuit. No, that's all, all right, I Thank you. Yeah. Here, here it's a balanced cycle. Here it's a here it's a three circuit, right? Here it's a balanced cycle, it's a two circuit. All right, so there's um, three easy properties I can I can tell you about that uh, all excluded minors for the class of bicircular matrix have. Um, uh, an excluded minor uh, will not have any non-trivial series classes, right? So I mean, suppose it did. Uh, suppose E prime was a series class. Well, contract E. Now it's bicircular. It has a graph representation. E is an edge in that graph somehow. Well, just subdivide it, right? And, and label that one of the edges E prime. Now these two elements are in series in the, and you have a bicircular representation of your excluded minors. That's, that's not possible, right? So no, no, no series classes in an excluded minor. It's, um, an excluded minor can have parallel classes, but not, not size three or bigger. Right? If you had a parallel class with three elements in it, well, I'll delete one of them. You get your bicircular, you get a graph. Uh, e prime and E double prime are still in parallel, so they have to be a pair of loops incident to a vertex. That's how parallel elements have to be represented in the bicircular matroid. Uh, well, just throw E back on there, of course, right? Now, now you've got a bicircular representation of uh, your purported excluded minor where you have a parallel class of size three. It's no problem. Uh, an excluded minor must be three connected. And it's not because the class is closed under two sums, the class of bicircular matrix is not closed under two sums, but it is closed under a special kind of two sum, I'm calling it a loop sum. If you've got a pair of graphs and an element E in each one of them that is uh, represented as a loop, I'm calling this the, the graph, the loop sum of, of G1 and G2. So identify the, the, and the incident vertex of E on, in each of those graphs and delete E. And this, this loop sum turns out to be um, exactly corresponds to the, uh, the two sum of these two bicircular matroids, right? So if you have an element in, in each that you can represent as a loop, then you can take that two sum in the graph and you get another graph representing the original matroid, right? So suppose you've got some excluded minor M and it's got a vertical two separation. Well, then it's a two sum on some base point uh, E Matroids are square and graphs are round, right? So I'm doing this two sum on, on E. Well, find a circuit in, in M2 containing my base point E and, and my another element E prime. Delete everything else and contract everybody except for those two elements. Now those two elements are in parallel, right? So they gotta be parallel loops in a, in a graph representing uh, M1. Well, delete E prime, and now I have a graph representing G, uh, M1 in which my base point element is a loop. So of course I can do that on the other side and I can then do the loop sum. Um, so that's a contradiction, right? So excluded minors for the class are vertically three connected. All right, so we're gonna need to wrestle with representations, of course, anytime we're dealing with excluded minors. So Cagliard, Del Greco, and Wagner in, in 1991 completely characterized all representations of bicircular matroids uh, by graphs in terms of three operations. So the first one they called rolling. If you've got a vertex of, um, well, this isn't exactly the entire picture, I have to be truthful, but um, essentially if you've got, okay, well, now that I've said that, I have to tell you the whole picture, I guess. So if you've got a, a, a Suppose this is a big hunk of graph here, and um, I have this vertex V showing up as a and another block of so there's two blocks maybe uh, a block attached to the rest of a graph, but if I delete that vertex, I get a tree in this in this N block of my graph. Right? So if I'm um, but if I'm vertically three connected, then I don't have um, it, then I'm not going to have this extra graph. So Let's just pretend this is a simpler case here for now. So if I've got a vertex that I can delete um, and see a tree, then I can choose any incident edge of that vertex and replace it with a loop on its other endpoint. So I chose that edge there and replaced it with a loop. You get another graph representing the same matroid. So that's just because 
all your cycles have to go through V. So your, your subgraphs that are circuits just get changed in form, but, but the same sets of edges are still circuit subgraphs in the resulting graph, right? So this, this pair of uh, tight handcuffs here turned into a pair of like, loose handcuffs with this loop here now, but it's the same. It's a circuit in, in both bicircular matrix, right? And you can do this with any, um, any edge you like, right? I can take any edge incident to V and, and replace it with a loop. So I get a whole bunch of different representations of the same matroid that way. But they're really well controlled, right? Um, which is good. Uh, the second operation is called a rotation. Um, so suppose you've got a vertex in your graph that if I delete it, I see a tree. Um, except possibly one cycle that kind of hangs off the tree like so, right? And, and from that, and from that, um, from that one cycle, uh, I've got an edge going up to my, my apex vertex here that I can delete to see a tree. Well, then I can relabel those three edges however I wish. And I have a new graph representing the same matrix. Right? And again, the reason is just that if you've got a circuit subgraph here that uses two of these edges, um, well, then it's, it, it changes from maybe a, a loose handcuff to a theta, but but all the circuit subgraphs stay invariant under uh, under that change. The, the set of circuit subgraphs stays invariant under that operation. Oh, and and I guess I mean to be tr more truthful, I guess about it that I could have a whole big um, hunk of graph attached to this vertex V, um, and that, and that would be still the operation is still permitted. Um, and these, these can be, um, these can be paths, um, actually, right. And then, uh, and, and I can make that change if, if I have a long path or right? then I have long series classes in my, um, in my bicircular matroid. And then the third operation is uh, replacement. So this is, uh, has to do with series classes again. You've got, suppose you've got um, a long, they call this a line. If you've got a, a these are actually degree two in my graph. Um, I can just shuffle those labels however I wish. And this, this graph will represent the same matroid, right? Because these are all elements in series, right? In your matroid. A, cyc a cycle um, along with a path to a vertex um, in your graph, um, they call this a balloon and so any, any, you can not only re, these are also in series, right? In the, in the matroid. So if I have, you know, a cycle is going to look like a circuit and your matroid is going to look like a cycle together with a path and, and then one of these cycles, right? So I can reach, I can shuffle the labels and I still get, you know, the same circuit, but I can also actually replace this balloon with any other balloon, as long as I have a cycle and a path or even a trivial path, um, the cycles, any, any subgraph forming this, a cycle, any circuit <laughs> uses this set of edges, no matter how I label them or how I replace it with a new uh, balloon, I get the same um, set of circuits in my new graph. So these are just easy operations to get the same matroid represented by different graphs. And that's all of them. So these three operations uh, give you all the representations if I'm big, ranked bigger than five. So if you got it connected by circular matroid, rank at least five and G and H are representing that matroid. G is obtained from H by either a sequence of rollings and replacements or a sequence of rotations and replacements. Right? And actually it, this also holds if, if rank is less than five, provided neither G or H is in one of a, a few specific um, kind of sporadic families that are completely also characterized and well understood by in this same paper. So we completely understand uh, representations of bicircular matroids by graphs and, and have since 1991. So we're, we're gonna call a bicircular matroid type one if, if it has a representation where I can do that rolling operation. We'll call it type two if it has a representation, a representation where I can do this rotation operation. And we'll call it type three otherwise, right? Vertically three connected type three matroids are uniquely represented. It's a really nice fact. Not as nice, but almost as nice as vertically three connected type one and two matroids. They're not uniquely represented, but they have a lot of structure, right? They're essentially 
of apex vertex over a tree um, and the, the alternate representations are really controlled. And right? so that's what makes our proof possible is this, this, uh, these, these restrictions on, on representations. So here's our strategy. Um, let n be an excluded minor of rank uh, at least eight. We're going to construct a twin uh, m for n relative to a set of three elements a, b, c. So a twin, but what I mean by a bicircular twin for n is a, is a matroid on the same ground set, such that however I contract an element uh, a, b, or c from each of those matroids, and now their matroids are the same. And then we'll use the twin um, to derive the contradiction that n contains a smaller excluded minor. But we're going to use the twin to show that n is quasi-graphic uh, and then use that quasi-graphic structure. So here's how we're going to build a twin. We're going to start with our excluded minor, and we're going to find these three elements, a, b, and c, and contract them one at a time and then two at a time. And, and, uh, and from these graphs that we'll then see, because we'll be graphic, we'll be bicircular as soon as we contract somebody, uh, I'm going to build a graph that, that agrees with, on the contractions with, with all of these um, graphs down here, right? Now, why, why not delete instead of contract, right? Well, this is an obvious question you might ask, right? Well, deletion can have non-trivial series classes, right? I, 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 might, um, I might very well uh, delete an element and see um, a bunch of elements in series. And I'd rather avoid that, right? Or, or right? I might see series classes in a graph that are like far away from each other, even, right? Because there's, I mean, you can imagine your twin might might want to contain an edge that uh, that, that that joins up things. But um, you know, even in a bicircular matrix, right? I delete that guy and and I see series classes. So um, that's problematic because of the fact that these these edges can then just kind of get relabeled and I get new representations, right? But when I contract, I don't see series classes. I see parallel classes and that's just fine, right? I'm happy to see parallel classes because they, they are essentially, uh, you know, uniquely, I, I can't, I can see a bunch of loops at a vertex. Um, that's just fine, right? So I'm, I'm happy with parallel classes, but I, but I don't want series classes. Uh, and do we really need three elements to do this, uh, to play this game? Well, yeah, we do. Here, here's, here's an example why. I mean, maybe I, I've got my excluded minor, I, I contract A, and I see a graph. Oh, so here's a graph for contracting A, right? I, oh, sorry. No, I contract A, and I see my element B sitting here. And then I contract B, and I, and I see A sitting here. Um, contracting both A and B, maybe this is uniquely represented, right? These, these might be all uniquely represented. Um, but yet, there's no graph I can I can construct that'll allow me to contract A and see this, and contract B and see this, right? So I need a third element somewhere further, somewhere far away from A and B that I can contract um, to keep A and B like from playing this silly uh, hide and seek game with me. Okay, so step one is to find these elements A, B, and C, um, and I need to find them in such a way that all these representations here are unique, or if not unique, at least well-behaved, right? At least, at least they're all type one or they're all type two. And, um, and, and I can understand how the variability in representations and control it. And I need connectivity to stay. I, need, I wanna stay vertically three connected at each step, right? I know my excluded minor is vertically three connected. If I keep my graph in every instance uh, two connected, that'll be enough to guarantee that all these contractions are, um, the matroids are vertically three connected. So that's um, kind of hard. I mean, it's, it's not, it's only hard in the sense that it's long and technical. It's um, not deep, it's just uh, laborious. Um, here's how, here how, we, how we do it. We, we first find an element to delete actually um, and stay vertically three connected up to series classes represented by a two connected graph. Right? So maybe I delete an element from my excluded minor and now I'm bicircular. I have a graph representation of that guy. I'll just pick three edges that, um, that share between them at most one vertex, right? So maybe I can pick a matching in the graph. Maybe I don't have a matching in the graph possibly, but uh, I can find three edges that'll do this. They share at most one vertex between them. And I wanna make sure again, I stay two connected of course, right? So once I find my element E that I delete to, to enable me to find these edges subject to these 
constraints. Um, now I want to put that edge E back in order to construct a graph, right? So I put it back by looking at what happens when I contract any of the A, B, or C, right? Because then I get a graph again, right? So, so suppose here's N delete E and I have a graph representing N delete E. Here's my kind of top row of my, my lattice of, of contractions there. Well, suppose I contract uh, A and I see this graph and, I, and then now I see E sitting in this graph somewhere, right? So it's, maybe it's right there, right? Now I'll contract B and I'll look for where, where does E show up, right? Well, maybe E, I track B, maybe E shows up here. Right? Now I'll contract C and look where E shows up. So I contract C and E shows up here, I suppose. Right? So if that happens, well, what, there is my twin, right? I should obviously use this graph for my twin. <laughs> yes, that's the idea. So, so finding A, B, and C in our paper is a, is a big, long section, but it's uh, only long because I have to worry about type one, type two, and type three, and I have to do it three times, basically. Um, Barry, uh, can I ask a question here? Um, yeah. Uh, just when you said you couldn't use two elements because you had right. that, but I mean, I'm sure you're right, but I'd just be interested to know what you say. That what, but when you see those two elements, haven't you sort of also found a local certificate of non bias, a uh, non, um, uh, um, non and couldn't you say, well, oh, that's an interesting pair and try to remove something else elsewhere to keep that local certificate so that you don't have to dive into the third element? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, it's, it's probably, yeah, it's just, I mean, it might, no, it might be a very good strategy. Um, uh, just we went to, we went with finding a third element to keep, to keep them straight instead. Um, well, no, no, whatever works, works, of course. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I mean, so maybe because it's our goal to build a twin. Um, right. So if, if we, if we chose elements that gave us this, we, this, like you say, it's a certificate that this guy is not bicircular, I guess. Um, but it, it's also not compatible with finding a twin, I guess, eh? So, so maybe it's just uh, not useful for twin building, but it might be, certainly might be useful for another uh, route to showing, mm, you know, yeah. restricting the size of an excluded minor in some sense. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, we, we want to find a graph up here, but but yeah, this, this, that might be a very good idea, or probably is. <laughs> is, is, that, that, is that an okay answer for you, for now at least? <laughs> yeah, uh, when okay. you say it might be a very good idea, it might, be, might seem like a very good idea in the middle of a talk, but when you actually come to try it out, <laughs> On you, well, and we're, we're going to need some some better ideas if we're going to show that that our list is complete. Um, yeah. So I'm happy to hear them. <laughs> All right. So so suppose we um, we've got our three elements, and uh, I've got my element C. I can contract far away from A and B, and that that sorted things out. And now I've got my twin. I've got a graph such that no matter where I contract A, B, or C, or any subset of A, B, and C, I see, I see graphs representing and contract A, B, or C, and I know where E lives in my twin. Um, here's where we start to um, massage our, our, uh, our twin and our excluded minor, and, and, and this is the meat of the proof here. This is the keys of uh, showing that excluded minor doesn't have rank bigger than uh, seven. So what's the difference between our twin and our excluded minor, right? There, there must be some uh, set, and we might as well choose it minimal, where the ranks, uh, I'll call it Y, the ranks differ, right, in M and N, right? So suppose Y is a circuit, if it's minimal, right, if my set Y is a minimal set with this property, then it's a circuit in one of these two matroids and it's independent in the other, right? So I'll call it, I'll, I'll call the matroid N or M, which is, uh, in which Y is a circuit C to help us to remember that that's, that's a, why is a circuit in that one, and it's independent in the other one. So I'll call that other one I, just for now. Our first claim is that none of A, B, and C can be in the closure of Y uh, in, in the matroid in which Y is a circuit. Well, because suppose one of them is in the closure of Y in, in that matroid. 
well, then when I contract that an element A that, that's in the closure, the uh, because it's in the closure of Y, the rank goes down, right? But the, but the rank of Y in, in C is, is one less than the rank of Y in I, right? Because it's Y is independent in I. And the, these two matroids are the same. When, once I've contracted A, because M is a twin for N, now I've, I've discovered that I've contracted A and the rank of Y has gone down by two. Right? So that's, that's ridiculous. So none of A, B, and C are in the closure of Y, uh, where Y is a circuit. But each of A, B, and C is in the closure of Y in the, in the NRM with, in which Y is independent, right? So suppose Y is not in the closure of, sorry, suppose A is not in the closure of Y in the matrix in which Y is independent. Same little calculation really. Uh, contract uh, A uh, from I, uh, the rank of Y stays the same because A is not in the closure, but the rank of uh, Y in, in I is, is, is bigger than in C. Um, but these matroids are the same. So now we've contracted uh, A from uh, C and discovered that the rank of Y has gone up, which is also ridiculous, of course, right? So, so each of A, B, and C are in the closure of Y in whichever one of those two, um, Y is independent. Right, so, so suppose Y is independent in the excluded minor and a circuit in, in the twin. Right, we're going to drive another contradiction to show actually it's the other way around, right? So if Y is a circuit in the twin, then it induces a bicycle in a, in a graph representing the, the twin, right? So it's, it's one of these three, Y forms one of these three subgraphs, right? And because um, then, then none of A, B, and C are in the closure of Y, um, that means not, none of A, B, and C have both ends in, in Y, right? So if, if, if one of A, B, or C had both of its ends in, in Y, right, suppose it was a, like a maybe A was like that, right? Then it's in the closure uh, of Y in the, in the twin and that, that's not happening. So, so that's not the case, right? But uh, each of A, B, and C are in the closure of Y and N in, in excluded minor. So when I contract A, B, and C are in the closure uh, of Y in N, contract A, right? But that's the same matroid as M contract A. So that means that after I contract A in the graph, both of A and B have to be, um, have both ends in, in, in Y now, right? Well, the only way that can happen is if you have some, something, uh, you know, maybe A is here and B and C are both dragged, oops, sorry, B and C both have their other endpoint dragged onto um, Y um, after I contract A, right? But that, that's only possible if A, B, and C all share a common end uh, in G and that's, we didn't choose it. We chose A and B explicitly not to do that, right? So, so there's um, a contradiction that shows, no, no, this, this set Y has to be a, cir a, a circuit in the, in the excluded minor and it has to be independent in the twin. Right, that doesn't happen. Right, so we've got this, this minimal set Y with, which tells us the difference between excluded minor and our twin. It's a circuit in the excluded minor, it's independent in the, in the twin and we, we know about the, these properties of A, B, and C. So this implies that in the, in the graph representing the twin, this, this set telling the difference between uh, M and N has to be either a cycle with A, B, and C as chords, right? So that's one way we could see this, um, this structure happen. Um, right? we, so I'm gonna draw a little picture here. So here's, here's my set Y. And um, maybe A, B, and C look like this, right? They're, they're, they could be chords in this cycle. That's one way they could be in the closure um, in the twin of, of Y, right? And Y being independent um, or um, Y is a, a bracelet, right? It's a pair of cycles and A, B, and C have to then show up as um, as edges going you know, between the, uh, the two cycles, right? That's how they could be in the closure uh, of Y in the twin, right? But not in the closure of Y in, in, in excluded minor. Does that make sense? Um, this, is, this is the whole key of the, of the proof here actually. Um, 
I mean, there's a there's a little bit of leaving out in terms of the, the technical details of this of this of this factoid here, but it's um, it follows fairly quickly, right? The only way you can have all these conditions met is is this is what um, y has to look like in the graph representing the twin. And a, b, and c have to be either chords or or edges running between a pair of cycles. Well, this looks pretty quasi-graphic now, right? I mean, so this y is uh, independent in the twin, but it's uh, a circuit in the in the excluded minor, right? So it's a bound cycle, <laughs> right? But this this set y is is independent in the bicircular twin that I've constructed, but it's a circuit in the excluded minor, right? It's a dependent bracelet, right? So just set uh, set your set curly B to be all those sets y where your y is a cycle in G and a circuit of n. Right, because this has to hold for every every set Y that, that has different ranks in, in N and M, right? And for every bracelet you see, just take this bracelet function to be um, assigning dependent if and only if it's Y is actually a circuit and you're excluded minor. And immediately via our previous hard work about um, the structure of, of, of circuits and quasi-graphic frameworks, um, we, we get that our excluded minor is quasi-graphic and, and that's collection of circuits is determined by the, by the bias graph along with this um, uh, bracelet function. Right, so now the rest of the proof's almost anticlimactic, right? If, if, if your bias graph along with your um, uh, bracelet function, ha if you have a dependent bracelet, if Y is a pair of vertex destroying unbalanced, uh, unbalanced cycles that form a circuit in your excluded minors, there's A, B, and C. Well, there's you take you CPF uh, this excluded minor uh, right away, right, as a minor because I mean A and B might share one vert. There could be one vertex shared amongst A, B, and C, but not not more than one. And so you can always find this this minor in that case. On the other hand, if all of the bracelets in my uh, in my excluded minor are independent, that means I've got some balanced cycle in my in my graph. And A, B, and C have to show up as chords somehow. Well, either I find, uh, you know, I just find one of a number of, of possible excluded minors, right? If my chords show up like that, I can find uh, the cycle matrix of K4. If my chords show up like this, I find this other excluded minor. I mean, this is some other known excluded minor. Um, if, if the cycle, if the chords have some other pattern, then I, I find some other excluded minor. And you just go through and grind out the possibilities and you just find excluded, you know, find small excluded minors in every case. Um, that are quasi-graphic. I mean, there's, there's the kind of the most annoying one to try and draw the geometric representation of, but it's got a really nice quasi-graphic framework, um, right? So that's 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 the proof that um, you have no excluded minor rank bigger than seven. And then then we we <laughs> we proved just the the worst bound we could find on, <laughs> on the number of elements. In, a, in an excluded minor, because we just, the paper was long enough by this point, right? We didn't, and, and we're tired. So we just, no excluded minor uh, has more than 75 elements uh, if it's got, I mean, we know it's, uh, because we know it has rank um, six or seven or less, and we have a bound on the number of elements in terms of rank in an excluded minor. And I think I listed it um, at the front of the paper, right at the, at the talk, didn't I? Um, I, I have a second part of my proof here. I have 50, 10 minutes. I don't, I don't know if I want to go through it or if people want me to go through it. Uh, I thought probably I would be well over time by the time I got here. Um, but I can skip to the bound, I guess. It's some um, people that want to ask questions about it, then they can, I guess. But here, here's our bound, right? You, you, you can have at most three edges, we prove, going between any pair of vertices. In an, after I delete an edge, uh, an element of my excluded minor. So if I exclude, if I delete an edge, I get a graph with R vertices representing an R rank R excluded minor. We prove that you can have at most three edges between them. And then you just can't have a ton of loops. You can have a loop at every vertex, I suppose, in theory, it seems unlikely, right? But uh, you certainly can't have more than two incident loops with any vertex and that would be enough. Um, but we, we also proved actually that you can have at most three vertices with, with two incident loops. So that's where this bound comes from. And so if you plug in R equals um, seven, you get um, whatever I said, I said you get, right? So here's our, here's our proof of our theorem. We, we, we just showed that no excluded minor has ranked bigger than seven. Um, 
all rank zero, all rank one matroids are bicircular. Nothing profound there. Um, rank two, well, you're, it's not hard to see that you're um, rank two and bicircular if and only if you have no, um, you don't have this thing as a, as a minor. And then otherwise, right, you just plug in, um, plug in seven into here and you get that no other excluded minor has more than uh, 74 elements. So, so the number's finite. That's the proof. And I'm done. Thank you. Um, we have not been uh, doing a, haven't found a good way of doing applause on the Zoom recording. So, but I'm sure if you go to the gallery, you can see all the claps there. Um, so now's a good time to open up the floor for questions. Uh, you can just talk out loud if you have a question. Do you know the other excluded minors that have uh, parallel pairs? Did you yeah. So, sorry, you asked, are there excluded minors that have parallel pairs? Did, did you know one? Do you know the excluded minors? Presumably they're easier to find. Yeah, so well, what we have is um, this whole list of excluded minors that Dylan and Gordon found. Um, and there's a bunch of them that have some parallel pairs. Um, I was just wondering whether you might be able to like, like get, get we give you, you a lot more information. So presumably like saying that, that these are those with parallel parallel at least should be much, much easier problem. So like you've got all these proofs and, and then once I know I've got a parallel pair that, 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 that basically correspond to a vertex element then. And that should, should be easier to, to figure out. Um, yes, yeah, I mean, it might be because you were kind of cutting out at the, at the start of what you're saying, but so I'm just looking for my, my excluded minor with a parallel. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, oh, now it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I know that, but basically I'm saying, could you actually, so you're having like, there's a big computation problem of finding the excluded min minors, but probably finding, finding the excluded minors that have parallel pairs is going to be a much, much easier problem. And then at least you can, can focus on three connected after, after that. Ah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it seems like it shouldn't be really, I mean, once you, if you have two parallel pairs, I mean, it seems like it should not be hard to find a, 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 a cycle matroid of two C three is an excluded minor sitting in there, or as a subgraph sitting in there somewhere. That was a minor. So, by the way, one thing one trick that I'm using early, earlier to like at looking at the other classes that are similar to get to actually being three connected. What I did, did is I I took the, instead of looking at looking at modes and asking, is this a uh, bicircular matroid? I would take a matroid and a subset of the elements and, and say, is there a bicircular matroid where these these elements are x elements? elements? Sorry, and your audio is uh, like uh, repeating a little bit, Jim. So maybe it's hard to hear you a little bit. But Daryl, were you able to hear the question? Well, kind of. I, he's going to try again, I think. OK. I hope it's better with head headphones. Um, um. <laughs> it still sounds like Max Headroom, <laughs> but, oh, but well. talk, talk nice and slow, and uh, and we'll, we'll see. What we, I should be able to understand. So the one that we we used when we were trying to find by excluded minors for classes like this, we would take a say, subset of the elements and say say these have vertex elements. So I say well, I wouldn't be looking at just matroids. I'd look at a matroid and a subset of the, of the elements. And I'd say, is this a bicircular made with these are vertex elements? So for, for example, we have a parallel pair that would have to correspond to a vertex element or a loop. And, uh, and then you can del delete one of them. Once you've said this has to be a vertex element, you can del delete one of them. So you actually reach the three connect connected. You use the question slightly. And then you actually have three, three connected. A reduction to three to connectivity. That's the way 
we're not on this with with uh, we not on this specific problem, but blade problems. That was the method we used. Yeah, I'd really, I'd, um, um, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd be really interested to 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 understand what you're saying. Um, so you're, you're just you're pick, you're you're arbitrarily choosing some subset of elements and then asking for if there's if they show up in certain configuration. Um, so uh, your the question changes from being given a matroid is this a vital matroid right? Your question would change change you have a subset of the elements like a root matroid. And when you take minors, you take take minors respecting the root of roots. And now you can say, can say is the rooted matroid is it bicircular? And by being a when a rooted matroid is bicircular, it means the uh, vertex elements are as they claim to be vertex elements. And you can even even have an operation where you where you just say something to no to no longer be an element if you like. But you can. Uh, becomes a more more restricted thing and then and then deposing to three connected is very easy then because if you've got a pair of parallel elements what you really really want for that to be a, a loop or a vertex element and so you can say this is now a vertex element and i did another one and now that's the, the, the pro sub problem i care about now and that way you actually actually reduce three connected and make it immediately yeah, okay. But that makes it, I mean, I mean you get that advantage, but then you have a disadvantage that you have these extra elements, these extra labels floating around from then on. Which in your, your case might make it any, any better. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, I I would love, maybe we can talk at some point um, afterwards um, and, and you can give me some more details and maybe then it won't be the, we can, yeah, okay. Yeah, it'd be a good discussion for uh, after the recording. Uh, but before then, are there any further questions? I guess I wanted to ask one thing, which is that uh, the three connected or vertically three connected should be easier. Like it seems from the, the proof that you got something really explicit then uh, from the twin, but I guess, are there still some assumptions about saying that the rank has to be at least something in order to get that out? Uh, it, when, I, when we're looking at the, if we're, when we're supposing that our twin, or we're su just supposing that our excluded minor has a vertical two separation? Um, like if your excluded minor is vertically three connected, can you yeah. say explicitly what it is then? Well, all the excluded minors are vertically three connected. Um, they have to be right by this, by this, um, by this. Right. I guess, I guess I just, uh, missed where in the proof the rank at most seven came up. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so that came up. Where did that come up? That came up because uh, of this diagram. Um, this one. So uh, our representation theorem says, um, if you're type three, in other words, if you don't have that weird structure where you, there's a vertex you can delete, you see essentially a tree, then you're uniquely represented if you rank at least five. And so five mm -hmm. plus three is eight. <laughs> ah, okay, <laughs> this, yeah, okay. This, this guy has rank at least five, now I, and I'm type three, then I know everybody here is uniquely represented. Right, okay, thank you. Good point.